thank you for welcoming me. And uh, the speakers here are thrilled with being here. Um, a cognitive approach to autism, Temple Grandin, who you know, wrote the foreword of, of my book. And I was thinking this morning, it won many awards, but I was thinking this morning of what she told me. She said, we can bring this book of mine down to people in the United States who are the poorest people because they cannot afford anything. And this approach is very, very practical. So um, I was just thinking of that, how, how it could be uh, an interesting thing to do. Um, I want to talk about Mitch, no respect for authority. <clears throat> I take him to a restaurant, and he has a boot on his foot. You know what I'm, you know, like a, a boot, his foot was broken, and, and he still has a boot on it. And the, um, the owner of the restaurant came over, and she said, you know, I had a boot on my foot like three or four weeks ago, and I couldn't figure out a, a way of, uh, of, of, of sleeping. How do, you, how do you position yourself to sleep? And what do you, now you have to help me on this. What, what as you're, if you're a parent and a teacher, he's saying nothing. What do you say to him while she's just standing there, asking him a question about his boot and sleep, what do, you, what do you say to this kid? If you were a parent, what do you say to this kid? Do you say, answer the question? Do you say, say something? What do you say to this kid? Well, I said nothing, right? I could have said, answer the question, right? If you say, answer the question, then you're telling the kid how to change his behavior. Answer. When someone asks you a question, answer it. Now, let's say he answers it. And I know people who work with kids on the spectrum. How many here are parents? All right, and teachers? And therapists? OK. So th this, this owner is saying, tell me about how you position yourself to sleep. And he might say, why? If he's going to answer the question, he might say something like, well, I, uh, I slept eight hours yesterday. In other words, he's answering the question, but it's not really relevant. So we want more than just the behavior, answering the question. I say nothing. She waits 20 seconds and walks away. I tell him, you know, Stacy, the owner, she thinks you're unfriendly. And he says, what do you mean? I didn't say anything. So. Yeah, you didn't say anything, but she thinks you're unfriendly because you didn't respond. So he doesn't have the concept, the underlying concept. I'm using this example of what a cognitive approach is about. <clears throat> he doesn't have the underlying concept that people will judge you no matter what, whether you like it or not. If I walk out in my underwear from my house, people are going to judge you. He doesn't have that. Imagine not having that idea going through your life and not having that concept that people will judge you. So I want to give him that underlying concept. I'm not interested in changing the behavior per se. I'm interested in him saying, whoa, oh, people will judge me. Maybe I should walk out of the house with, uh, with my hair combed, with my shirt buttoned correctly. I want, that, I want that idea to be taught to the kid. That's a cognitive approach, not the behavior. I don't really care, in a sense, of him answering the question. I want him to get the underlying concept. Um, no wonder he has no uh, um, sense of, of respecting authority, because he doesn't understand that authority judges him. Um, now, the behavioral approach that I'm talking about behavior started, or not started, but we have, uh, you know who he is, B.F. Skinner? You've heard of him? Um, and at Harvard, he produced this Skinner box where a rat would press a lever, and what did he get when he pressed the lever? He got a pellet. He got food. The food was a reinforcer, it, uh, he, and, and being reinforced increased his frequency of behavior of pressing the lever. Reward and punishment. That is 
very common, reward and punishment. What I'm saying, we need to go something else, underlying it. So here's a little joke. Why does one rat saying, to, imagine a graduate student giving these pellets every time the rat presses the, the, the bar. What is one rat saying to the other? Have we got this guy trained? Every time we push down the lever, he gives us food. And there's some truth in that. And we know that kids do train us. I ask a kid a question, and what happens? The mother answers it, right? That, that, you know, the father answers it. So we're always filling in for the kids. <clears throat> so the behavior approach or the medical approach, you have behavior, you have a label or a measure. It could be a, uh, anxiety or, or uh, some label for it. Then you may take medicine and you change behavior. Well, that works. That medical model works great with diabetes. Behavior, medicine, change behavior. A cognitive approach. You have behavior, you see how the mind works, all right? You see how his mind works. Change that, and that in turn changes the behavior. Um, I would love to take, I, I would love if, to take questions at the end, so I'm gonna try to not say everything I was planning to say. Here's a kid. He throws chairs every, almost every day. This is, I, was, I know this firsthand. He would, the teacher would come over to help him, and he would uh, throw the table over, kick the garbage can, and he would lose one and a half hours of school. This is what they told me every day, one and a half hours. He would leave the, have a tantrum, leave the class, and then he would get punished another 45 minutes. So it was like an hour and a half every day he lost time in school. So what do you do with a kid like this? Baseball. It worked for this kid, right? And, in, in the, and that's, and that's what, what, I, what I want to bring to you. Every kid is different, but there, I think, is a right way to work with that particular kid. So we played baseball. Now, he loved baseball. Now, I know there are people here or elsewhere. He loves baseball. What do you do? OK, you have to be good. You'd be really good in school, and then you could play baseball. Well, no, 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 no. Let's embrace baseball. Let's use baseball as a way of changing his behavior. So, all right, I, I have to ask you a question. What is the right way to catch a baseball? Is it like that, or is it like this on the side? Do you go right under a fly ball, or you go to the side? What'd you say? The side. The side. Does everybody agree with that? You catch a baseball like this, or you catch a, or you catch a baseball like this? Like this, right? You'd get under the ball. He was like this. And he missed some, he caught some. And I said to him, went over to him and said, hey, do you want, I can show you an easy way to, to, uh, to, catch, to catch the ball. He says, yeah? I said, yeah, you wanna, you, you have, what do you, he says, okay. So I showed him, he was doing it like this, so I, I went, this is, and I know why he doesn't do it like this, you know why. He's afraid the ball's gonna hit him on the head. I said, don't, just, just don't worry about it. Just, and he did it, he caught almost every one, and then he said something to me that very few kids said. He said, thank you, thank you. I knew I had him. He said, thank you, I knew I had him. And then I said, you know, the teacher's trying to do the same thing. He said, what are you talking about? When you're having trouble with a math problem, all the teacher's trying to do is show you an easier way to do it. He goes, yeah? I said, yeah. He said, okay. I said, all right, yeah, you're okay, yeah. I'm good with that. You have to go a step further. For the teachers and the parents especially, you have to go, now he's with me. Now he's saying to me, yes, it's, and now I get the idea of the teacher coming over and helping me. You have to go a step further. And the step, the, 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 uh, the step is what? I ask the kid, what do you want the teacher to say to you when she comes over? Why do I ask that? I want the kid to be empowered. 
I want the kid to be in control. So he said, and the kids will surprise you. So he said, um, I want, uh, I, I just tell her that she's, uh, she, she can show me an easy way to do the problem. He kind of said what I predicted, but it doesn't have to be that way. In this case, he said that. So what do I do? I called the teacher that evening. I called the teacher that evening, and I tell her, when you go over to him, say these words. Say these words that I'm just trying to show you an easy way to do the problem. And would she listen to me, do you think? Yeah, well, because it's going to make her life a lot easier, right? I mean, he's not going to have, hopefully not going to have a tantrum. She did that. It helped the relationship with, with the child. And virtually no more tantrums after that. Virtually no more tantrums. So that's how I used baseball therapy, I call it. <clears throat> uh, I've used table tennis. I use chess, I've used magicians, I've used yoga, I use music, I use art. And that's why this conference uh, really touches on almost all of that. To get come together and use these things for the, I like to say perfect thing to do for that child. You have to understand the child. Um, are people getting seated or? What I would like to do is bring you into one of my sessions and, um, and talk about, talking about other disciplines, how I used yoga to, um, to help this child. So this child's name was Addison, or that's the name I have in the book. And she came, she came to the office, and she was the most, one of the most destructive kids I have ever seen. She would come to the office, and she would go around the room, and she would take all the papers on my desk and throw them on the floor. She would take, she would take this wooden toy and bang my computer. I still have a dent on my computer. She was just totally, and you know what, as a human being, it's like, ah, I want to, you know, but I reminded myself I'm a professional. I remind, and I, she came back, I don't know what the noise is from. She came back, and she sat down, and what I said, now you have to realize I take my sessions. These are my exact words. And when I looked at this, as I'm giving this talk, I, I've read this book before with, with, the, with this incident, I love the way I phrase it. Now look, you all know that when a kid misbehaves, right, you don't say, oh, that, kid's, that kid is a terrible kid. But you say the behavior is terrible, right? But I don't want you to even say that. At least that's not how I think. And when I read this over, I said, this is exactly the way I think of it. I'm, I'm not concerned about the behavior per se. I'm concerned about how her mind works, right? We talked about that. So I said, so after all this destruction, I said, Addison, it looks to me as if your mind is jumping from thing to thing. Her mind, and, I, and that's it. Thank you. Her mind is jumping from thing to thing. It's not, oh, you're misbehaving. You know, you want to go outside and play? You want to go get pizza? Or, or, uh, do you want to uh, uh, go to the restaurant? No, I'm not using it that way. I'm saying, hey, I'm not concerned with the behavior per se. Your mind is jumping from place to place. Um, so she looked. Uh, and she listened, and she nodded her head. She nodded her head. OK, so she, she gets it. She, gets, she understands what I'm saying. Her mind is jumping from place to place. And then, and then I say, this thing that happens, I said, let's call it something. If she, 
she knows what she's doing when she's going around and jumping from place to place. If she could call it something, then we could embrace, when then we have something to talk about. Then we have something to fix, in a sense, right? Then we could, so she says, uh, I said, could you think of a name for it? And she said, and I, I wrote this maybe two years before the book got published, holding my breath that nobody used this word because it was perfect, just perfect. And she said, zooming, zooming. I mean, how great is that? She called it, that's how she envisioned it, it's zooming. And I said, what's the next? And, I, and the therapist and the teachers and the parents could almost predict what I'm going to say. Oh, zooming, great. Do you like zooming? Right? You want to get the kid on her own side. Do you like zooming? She says no. <sighs> All right. Right? She doesn't like what she is doing. So all I need to do is tell her or have her or help her know what to do about it. I mean, that, that makes sense. So she says no. And most kids will say no. Most kids who misbehave really don't like it. They don't like it either. So why do you need to punish them? They don't, they don't like it either. So I'm not into the punishment or the reward for that matter. All right. Um, so I say, uh, what could you do to stop Zooming? So if I ask you, and you're welcome to shout out, what could she do to stop Zooming as a teacher or a parent or a therapist or a director, um, what do you think? What could she do to stop Zooming? What's the idea? What, what would you say? What would you say? What could you do to stop Zooming? What would you say? Get a what? Get a her body. Interesting. Oh, you guys are too smart. Here's, here's the answer, or my answer. I don't know. I don't know what she, I really don't know. I mean, that's the truth. I don't know, right, what it takes for her to stop zooming, I need to, I need her to tell me. It's her mind and body, right? I need her to tell me. That's the, the subtitle of the book, uniquely normal is the book, but the subtitle is Tapping the Reservoir of Normalcy to Treat Autism. Tapping the Reservoir. I want it to come from within her, come from her. And this is very interesting. Remember, she's six years old. I didn't tell you that. She says, you tell me, or Mary, who's the therapist, the yoga therapist there who I brought into the session, or well, Mary can tell me. I'm 100% sure, and you can't prove me wrong, so I could just say anything I want. I am 100% sure she was never asked, what do you think about your own behavior? Because this display of throwing papers on the floor, that's what she does that in school too. So her whole life, her whole life, hello, is based on people telling her what to do, Oh, you want to go outside and play? Don't, you know, they're just con trying to control her. I want her to control herself. So she says, you tell me, and Mary tells me. Um, then I said, Addison, you decide. What could you do to stop Zooming? She says, you tell me. She has no other way. You tell me. I say, no, I can't. Mary can tell me. I don't wait for Mary to respond because I, I'm going for it. You know, I'm just insisting that she's, I'm trying my best. If she winds up not saying anything, I don't, that's it. Let's do something else for next week. So I just don't even let Mary speak at this point. I said, uh, Mary can tell me. No, she can't. This went back and forth for like 10 minutes. Because I, I finally, let me see. Okay, I, okay, Addison, I said, I'm going to tell you what to do. Okay, so she won. She wants me to tell you, I said, I'm going to tell you what to do. And I said, you have to tell me what you need to do to stop this. Now, it's not going to work with a 14-year-old. 14-year-old say, yeah, leave me alone. What are you, you're trying to fool me. It's, you know, screw you. But I say, you have to tell me what, and I, I said in a very stern voice, you have to tell me what you have to do to stop this. Um, so she sprang from her chair, planted her feet about 12 inches apart, inhaled deeply while raising her arms as if to perform a swan dive, then lowered her arms slowly to her sides, 
and exhaling slowly and said, there, I stopped what I needed to stop. And that was it. She knew how to center herself. She used yoga. Mary did yoga with her like 20 minutes earlier. And she just knew what she needed to do with her body and her mind. And that was it. No more zooming. In this case, it doesn't always work. In this case, I saw her maybe two or three more times. I never saw her again. She just knew what she needed to do for herself to control herself. So that's, that's, um, that's Addison. Uh, this is just something I thought was cute. Uh, um, could you read that? You read my shirt, that's enough social interaction for one day. Um, so I want to go on with, with, uh, with Julia, well, Julia. I say Julia 20 times in the, t in the his tape, so there's no such thing as confidentiality when it comes to her name. But um, I want to talk about her and maybe one other slide, and then I'd like to have you know, maybe a few questions from you guys. Uh, I have about 20 slides after my presentation <laughs> to, uh, to share with you. But uh, let, so here's a girl who had no language. Let's see if I, this plays. Turn. What do I do? Say push it. Tell me. Push it. I do it. Push it. Push it. So you're getting a it. sense of how I'm doing Say this cognitive it. therapy. Nice. That uh, I'm it. trying to tell her what to tell me at the moment she wants to me to push it or, or maybe want, you know, and it's, it's not going to work because she has no language. After about five weeks, this happens. <clears throat> Julia, who should open the bottle? Okay. You open it, Lauren. Who should open the bottle? Julia, who should open the bottle? Who should open the bottle? You open it, Rob. Who should open the bottle? You buy Rob. Okay, I'm gonna open it. Uh, I guess we'll move on. Okay, so that was five weeks. This is three or four months. I have, I tape almost all my sessions. So I have uh, 12 videos of her for every month. Yeah, you have two. You have two. Uh, two. A chew? A two? A chew or two? A uh, two. A uh, chew. Now I understand. <laughs> Are you sneezing? A uh, chew. Gesundheit. <laughs> Gesundheit. <laughs> you know, I know it's cute, but what's interesting, she laughs when I say, when I, when I get it. Boy, she has a lot of patience with me. She laughs when she knows that's the connection. It's not enough that she's trying so hard for me to understand what she's saying, but when I say, you know, then it's like, then she laughs. We have that connection. That's, you know, it, that's communication. I don't know if, I, I think I have time to play all of these. Do you want to, you want to see these or? Uh... Julia, sit down. Okay, I'm going to sit down. Can I have one? I eat yours. No. Can I have one, please, sweetie? No, it's mine. Get back. Sit down. No, I don't want to sit down. Sit down. I want a popcorn. Sit down. This is my chair. No, it's not your chair. <laughs> so you teach her to talk, and now she's being, you know, it, 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 it shouldn't work this way. All right, this is after 10 months, and she was pretty, you couldn't distinguish her. Here's a girl that went from no language at all to someone who you can't really distinguish, I think, from a typical kid. We just play a little of this. He's really stuck in here. He needs stuff. It's he, he needs someone's help. For what? For he needs his friends back. He needs his friends. How about this one? Why does he need help? Because he needs to get out and swim now. He needs to swim. Oh, uh, help us. Can you help me, please? 
With what? What do you want me to do? Go on. Let me, I'm gonna. Um, I want to play this, and then I want to get some of your input, your questions, if there are any. Uh, and this um, this slide I've never shown any anyone before. But when I saw it in preparing for this, I said this is a good way to end the the, uh, the session. The idea of ex expectations for these kids that you really there really shouldn't be any limits. And I'll since I have an, another minute. There's a difference between intellectually disabled and retardation and autism. Auti half the kids, no, uh, at least half the kids with autism are, are not retarded. They're not intellectually disabled. Statistically, about half. So why, why have limits at all? Even kids who are uh, intellectually disabled, why put limits on this kid? What are you thinking? You think his mind is just blank? Caesars, he said. Ice cream. Ice cream? Ice cream, yes. Hello. Hello. What else are you thinking? It's just what it's just what I was saying. You think his mind is blank, and now he says scissors and ice cream. He's right on cue. Well, your shoe, thinking about your shoe. What else are you thinking? Am I going to know he's going to start saying words? I just think I'm giving him the benefit of doubt. That he's, I'm looking at him and he looks like he's thinking. So go with it. As if he has no limitations. As if he's just a normal kid. What do you think? Don't know it. Yeah, you just limit him without knowing it, and he yeah. will raise up to those expectations because that's it. This is what you expect. Well, you treat him like a disabled. Uh, yeah. yeah. He said, "But I'm afraid it's, to set expectations high." Yeah, and then and you fall right, head like front. Not gonna... He's never done that before, right? No. I wouldn't even dream if somebody would ask him, well, what are you thinking when you say scissors and ice cream? <laughs> you see, because I set the expectations low. Right. And I would never ever in my life would ask him, what are you thinking? But don't think like this, because right. if you think like this, you lose every opportunity. Right, that's right. So what we're, that's part of our training, kind of, mm -hmm. for you to rethink about him without being frustrated. Yes, yes. And if he doesn't do it... Oh, okay, we'll just end it there. Um, so, um, we have another minute or so. Are there any reactions, comments, questions? Uh, any thoughts? Uh, this whole idea of expectations is just crucial, I think. Because, like she was saying, the, often the kids will rise to your own expectations. That's what she was saying. And if we have low expectations, then often we don't give the kids the opportunity to, to move on. Um, yeah, we actually, I actually cut off the end of that, but, um, well, thank you very much.